This is Ronald Guittardi. I'm assistant director of the Oral History Project on board the battleship New Jersey. Uh, we're here on the battleship today, August the 10th, 2012, and we're here to interview Joe Husick of uh, Carrollton, Texas. Joe, thank you for your service, and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. And can we start out by, let's see, can you tell me what your uh, your rating was and your job aboard the ship? I was a fire controller in third class, the main battery fire control. My initial assignment was as a side angle reflection operator on Mark 8 computer. My last six months of duty, I was auxiliary fire control operator in turret number three. And your main battery work was that down in forward plot? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, let's start out by, uh, and your dates of service, please, uh, Joe? January 1, 1944, on or about April 15, 1945. That's your service aboard the New Jersey? Yes, sir. And your dates of uh, service in the Navy? Was, uh, Again, it was uh, June of 43 to uh, approximately May of 46. Okay, very good. Uh, Joe, can we start out by you telling us uh, how you got into the Navy? How I got into the Navy? Well, uh, as a youngster living in a small town, we had uh, our usual double feature movies which cost us 10 cents to get in. And uh, we always had a RKO video that uh, preceded the movie, and it showed uh, the uh, war going on in Europe and uh, what it was like to be an infantry in the infantry. And I decided that wasn't what I wanted to be, and so it just only seemed proper to me to get into the Navy. And that's how I uh, got here. Did you have any family that preceded you in military service? Your father or anybody no. else? No. Okay. So uh, what would you do? You enlisted in uh, in your hometown? Well, initially, initially they had a, the Navy had a V6 program when they came to high school and checked out uh, possible quality qualifiers for the air flight training program in Memphis, Tennessee. I had the grades to, to make that program, and in fact, I was selected to go to that program. But after I got out of high school and a new time had passed, I thought, well, they aren't going to call me, so I just signed up for the regular Navy. Okay. You were interested at the time in being a, a, a naval aviation. Uh, uh, it was a good opportunity to to, uh, to go to it, I thought. and. Uh, so uh, just as soon as my boot, tra boot training was over with, uh, orders came through to call me to that school. And when it was decided I had uh, already completed boot training, uh, the powers to be said, well, let him go ahead and go into the regular Navy. Okay. Now you, you entered the service in uh, 43 and uh, when, how, oh, in 44 you got assigned. So, what did you do before you got assigned to the Battleship New Jersey? Well, in between the time I got out of uh, boot camp, I was assigned to uh, for temporary duty in Darfur, uh, opening and cleaning quad 50, or 50 caliber guns, machine guns. Okay. And where did you board the uh, New Jersey? Uh, for the first time? January 1st, 1944, in Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia. Had you been to Norfolk before that? No, sir. No, no that, that was all new to you then. All new. Had, had you seen the Atlantic Ocean before that? No, sir. No, okay. What did you think of the battleship New Jersey when you first saw her? Well, coming from a small town, never having seen anything else bigger than a 12-gauge shotgun. It was the biggest damn thing I ever seen in my life. 
closer I got to it, the bigger it became. Okay, then when, uh, how soon did she put to sea? After you uh, you came aboard, right away? Well, I recall, I went to sea the next day. Okay, and how, how was that? How were your sea legs on your first uh, sea voyage? Uh, a little wobbly initially, but not bad. You got over it fast? Yeah, I got over it. Did you have uh, much trouble uh, well, in, with seasickness uh, at sea? Not much because I had been on a I had been on a cruise up in Lake Michigan uh, in my senior year of high school, which was rougher than the water we were having going down toward the canal. And I learned that uh, when you got sick and you just laid down on the deck and on your stomach, that uh, you could shake that. So that's that's what I did. I I learned to compensate for it. So oh, I didn't I didn't have much of that seasickness. How about your shipmates? Did some of them have trouble with the sea sickness? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Quite a few hanging on the ropes. Okay, so then uh, did the ship go uh, right through the canal to the Pacific then? Stopped at the canal, took on supplies, and went left the next day. Okay, and wh what was your first stop in the, in the Pacific? Do you remember? Atoll called Tunafuti. Say the name again. Funa Fudi. Funa Fudi. Okay. They can spell it F-U-N-A-F-U-T-I. Funa Fudi. And what was there? A Navy facility of some kind? No, there was no Navy facility to my knowledge. It was just a, just a place to stop. What did you do? Take aboard supplies or anything like no, that? No, just, just, just more or less, I guess, a collecting point for the ships that we're going to get together later on. Okay. And where did you go from there? Tom Bennett. Uh, I'm not quite there. I think we just uh, proceeded from there out toward the uh, uh, whatever islands were there. I don't really recall all that, but out where they made they, they started collecting the fleet together. Uh, Ulithi comes to name. Uh, yeah, that was a major staging yeah, base. Ulithi. Yeah. And so I don't, I'm not quite sure where we exactly went. Tell us a little bit about your duties in fire control. What it was like? What's a typical day like? Well, uh, of course, when you're aboard ship and uh, you had, uh, you actually had three functions there. You had your, you had your general quarters function, and you had your shift duties, which uh, my shift duties were. I was always put on shift at a uh, quad 40 gun mount, and then of course you're when you're off that off of that for shift duty, then you are responsible for going around and uh, maintaining the equipment, cleaning optics, lubricating whatever other words, whatever was required of you by your chief petty officer to do. And your general quarter station was was a my fire general control. quarter station was in Main Valley Fire Control. Yes. Okay. And you're, you served watches then on uh, on one of the 40 millimeter gun mounts. Which well, one do you remember? No, I don't. It's right below. It was right below the captain's bridge, or his where his hangout was. The captain's cabin or the navigation bridge? The captain's cabin. The captain's cabin. So that might have been level 01, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So so tell us what you did to uh, fire the big guns. Well. I was not, I was one of, I recall, maybe, maybe five or six people and uh, manning the Mark 8 computer. And for those who are not familiar with the Mark 8 computer, it was, uh, it was uh, very simple. You could look inside it and see if your solution was being solved properly, and if not, you'd take it along. Alan set the wrench and go in there and make it <laughs> set up. Uh, I was a sight angle deflection operator, and after I got out of service, I more understood understood what that meant. But it was actually a, a compilation of the, all the different things that affect the flight of the projectile, like wind, direction, uh, 
rain, you name it, anything that would interfere with the normal flight of the projector, that had to be put in the computer so that it might be compensated for. And did you put did you put that stuff into the computer? Yes, I did, but I got that from somebody else. Okay. All I had to do was spin the knobs and set it. In other words, it's as I again, as I recall, if you put all that all that stuff into the, into the problem, you come out with some kind of an adjustment. And, and I remember setting such and such a degrees into the computer. That was my job. Okay. And who who pulled the trigger? Trigger to fire the big gun. The operator of the Mark One computer. Okay. Pulled the trigger. And where was where was he? Was he also in forward uh, plot? He was also in forward plot, and he was uh, he had a little Mark One computer, and uh, it had a a, uh, a magnetic uh, ring on it where it showed the chip when it rolled and when it pitched and what have you and when all those needles come together and he had to order the fire that's when he squeezed the trigger and the ship was perfectly level and everything was okay and yeah that had, is that that's the device that had gyroscopes in it and all that for measuring right. the were, roll and the pitch of the ship were, our ship was it our ship was at level at that precise time okay great and um, what do you remember uh, about the, uh, did you, before the typhoon of 40, before we get to that, did you see any action before the typhoon? Uh, any? Uh, oh, yes. You, what did you, do you remember firing on any islands or uh, uh, any amphibious, participating in any amphibious operations? Well, yeah. All, you might say all of the, uh, landings that we had uh, during that period of time that I was aboard, and I think that was almost everything except after Guadalcanal and Midway. Uh, we were involved in uh, all the troop landings and firing uh, at uh, ground fire for the troops, and uh, we had our occasional problem with aircraft, but my main battery, my main duty was uh, Firing, for firing the big guns. Yeah. yeah. And what was it like when you were uh, doing shore bombardment? Was it was it pretty busy in uh, in gun oh, yeah. fire control? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty busy. Yeah. Yeah, I, guess, uh, I remember very very busy during that time. Do you remember being afraid at any any point in time? One time, uh, right, right along the, uh, uh, after the engagement, or during the engagement of Okinawa, we were also involved in uh, some, some so-called cleanup work in uh, the Philippines. And uh, we were being led by Admiral Halsey to believe that we were going to be involved in some one-on-one -on -one arrangements, meaning ship ship on ship type stuff. And we stayed awake all night long at general quarters. Uh, and yeah, I was a little nervous about knowing that I was going to be sh shooting shells at a ship and he's going to be shooting back at me. That scared me a little bit. Was, was that the Battle of Leyte Gulf? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, uh, Halsey took some flack for uh, for heading north and leaving the uh, the landings well, uh, he, unguarded, what do you? If, I, if he were here today, I would say that I would say that uh, I believe he might have cut and run a little bit. Uh, He's the, the his, Some historians say he was decoyed by the Japanese to head north for battleships that were just no, I mean yeah. carriers, carriers that were just decoys. What do you think? I say that during that particular time, I'm sure that the powers to be recognized that the war was coming to an end, and they did not want to engage all their new ships in, in, a, in a situation. So as opposed to putting the, the new battle wagons down there in harm's way, they chose maybe to cut and run. Uh, 
I don't know that, but I always thought that all the Chinese took us took us north up into the China Sea a little premature. Yeah. And then uh, after, after Nimitz told them to turn around, he did. Yeah. And then of course that was we got in on the tail end, which is that's a good safe place to be. On yeah. The tail end. <laughs> Okay, I think that was October 44 or something like that. Yes, sir. And okay, then uh, how, how about the typhoon of December 44? What what can you remember about that? Well, I remember it. I just happened to, for whatever reason, I just happened to get a duty assignment up on the bridge during that period of time. The navigation bridge? Up on the navigation bridge. And. Uh, I just remember the ship pitching and rolling, and uh, the, uh, the sides would disappear from one side to the other, and when the bow went under, it shook the whole ship, and it seemed like it stayed under forever until it come back up. And I could see that right there from that, that deck. You had a good bridge, view. The navigation bridge. You had a good I, view I from there. a good there. view of it. And uh, of course, every time it came out, I uh, got got drenched. And down she'd go again shortly after, and be gone for quite a while. It was uh, it was serious. But I never felt scared on that big old on this big old ship. I never felt scared. Yeah. I figured anything sink this baby. <laughs> yeah, she rode uh, fairly well compared to some of the destroyers yeah. and destroyer yeah. escorts. Did you did you see some of them bobbing around in the? Uh, well, all the, all the small craft, uh, of course, I can only imagine what it was like to be on a tin can uh, compared to what was going on on our, on our ship, how much they, they, they probably stayed under out of sight for minutes at a time. Uh, and then, of course, the, the word filtered back to us that some of them didn't uh, stay upright during the thing, three or four of them. Three. Three caps and, and the scuttle that was that the, they had asked for and asked for permission to take on seawater because they were running low on oil and uh, that seawater would have kept them afloat. But somebody up in higher headquarters uh, denied them that privilege, and so they went they went down in and on. Okay, that's uh, some people. Uh, Say it was the inexperience of some of those destroyer co uh, commanders that uh, uh, caused them not to ballast. You're saying that uh, no. they asked permission to ballast, ballast with seawater, and they were denied no. that. When the fire patrolman, third class, my my, the scuttlebutt had it to us that they had asked for permission to take on seawater, which would have kept them where they could ride it out. And that permission was denied. So, so uh, did the scuttlebutt say why permission was denied? By uh, any give any reason why they well, denied it? No, except further scuttlebutt would be that uh, uh, that the commanders to be uh, figured that if they put seawater on the ships, that this could cause malfunction in the other parts of the ship, which would make them not capable to perform their mission when we came out of the typhoon. So I don't know it's so uh, but we do know that uh, saving a ship would have been the most paramount thing to do. Don't worry about the other thing later on. Yeah, one of the theories was that uh, some of the commanders didn't ballast because uh, to uh, deballast to get ready to take on more fuel which they were trying to do for several days took six to eight hours, something like that. Yeah. And they didn't want to have to tell Halsey that it was going to take that long before they were ready to refuel. And some of them were pretty low on fuel. I, otherwise, I don't, otherwise, I would not know what, what happened there, but the scuttlebutt that, that I got at that particular time at my young age was that they asked for permission to take off seawater to help their balance, and they were denied the privilege. You said uh, you were in the navigation bridge and you got wet. Were the windows open or just water just came in anyway? Uh, I was out where I could get wet. So now I, okay. I was out on a shield. I, uh, 
Oh, you weren't inside. You I were at, inside. at one outside. of the watch stations, maybe? Uh, I suppose you could say that. I didn't know I was outside. Okay. I, I could see the bow and I could feel the, I could feel the mist coming back. Was there anybody up on the open bridge above the navigation bridge at that time during the typhoon that you remember? The only thing I remember up there was the quartermaster and uh, myself and another guy that was on duty with me. Uh, as far as that, I don't have any recollection of who else was up there. Some people fault uh, Halsey for not avoiding the storm. What do you What do you think, the typhoon? He was pretty anxious to help to get back into action supporting MacArthur's invasion of the Philippines. And some people think he kind of ignored the severity of the uh, typhoon, thinking they could ride it out. What do you think, and what was the scuttlebutt at the time? I don't recall there being any discussion about that board ship. I, I, to me, it was it was just that we run into a bad patch of weather, and uh, and of course uh, hindsight tells me that, uh, that being a skipper of a large vessel like that, or uh, admiral, that you got weather conditions that I don't have, and you could have probably chose to take the fleet whichever way you wanted to to avoid the trouble. But hindsight also tells me that that uh, when you have a mission to perform, that's part of the game. Uh, so they were fighting the war. I was just a little guy in the situation, you know. But uh, so about the about the destroyer, though, that was big time. That was big time scuttled on board ship. About how that happened. Yeah, did you hear about the uh, ship, the destroyer escort that rescued about 55 uh, sailors from the three uh, capsized destroyers? Did you hear that that story? No, sir. No. Okay. Uh, during the typhoon, uh, did you get seasick? No. Did uh, a lot of your crewmates? I'm sure they did. Uh, Well, you get pretty used to the fact that after a while it's rocking and rolling. You just grab a hold of rope and try to hang on, and uh, and uh, the, that, that that part of the of it moving doesn't seem to affect you after a while. You know? No, I never. Yeah. I think that little trip I had up on Lake Michigan, where I did get seasick, sort of prepared me for what to do. I did initially after after you after you get used to it initially why uh, it doesn't bother you that all that much. What was eating your meals like in a typhoon when the ship was rocking and rolling? Well, that wasn't very pleasant. <laughs> uh, we served in, we were served our meals in trays, and then we set the trays down on a metal surface. <laughs> And when it was rocking and rolling, your tray would go flying off and go any which way and ever. It wasn't a very good thing. <laughs> your meal and my meal might have been coming the same meal, and we'd eat a little bit of it when it come back by us, so to speak. Yeah, it wasn't funny. Do you remember what kind of food they served during the typhoon? No, I don't. Uh, I think it was pretty drab, to say the least. Cooks couldn't cook either. Yeah, it could be dangerous in the kitchen. I'm sure we didn't have much, but whatever it was, it was moving around. Probably sandwiches or something like that. Moving around quite a bit. And what do you think about Halsey and the typhoon? Should he take the blame for the three capsized ships, or uh, is that part of the responsibility of command? Okay. The uh, fleet commander is in charge at that particular time. I know he didn't violate 
uh, Admiral Nimitz's orders. Don't think. If he did, I don't know anything about it. But uh, he's the fleet commander, and uh, he's, he knows more about what's going on than I, I did at that time. And so uh, I can't say that he should or shouldn't. Uh, I, uh, I don't, I don't know. I always thought that Admiral Halsey wasn't being quite square there at that, at that time in history of during the Battle of Lake Tico. I, I think he, I think he uh, sort of he fouled back, up. Took the back road out. I, I believe that often. Okay. Did you form any lasting friendships uh, while you were aboard the battle battleship New Jersey? Uh, a couple. Uh, Are they still around? I really don't know. I'll try to contact them, but uh, no luck. No. How did you get along with the officers? Got along fine with the officers. Any any particular officers that you liked, and that were. Uh, you got along better than others? Well, I never had to deal with too many officers. Uh, our primary officer we dealt with was Lieutenant Khan. K-A-H-N, his name. And he was, uh, well, I found all officers to be pretty square people in the Navy. I didn't find too many that were, you know, really badasses, so to speak. And, uh, well, I think that first uh, executive officer we had and during my period of time, I think he was a SOB, but then later on I learned what their job was. That's what their job was, to be SOB. <laughs> 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 so, so it, uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of like uh, when somebody gets on your case about something and you start asking, well, what did they get on you about? And everything they say, say is what you're supposed to be doing, so you know, you run out of reasons for disliking it. How about the Chiefs? Did you get along uh, with the Chiefs okay? Sure. You did. You were third class, petty officer, third class. Any memorable people among the Chiefs? Well, you remember the first one you had was the Chief Brown on mine. How come you remember him so well? Because he chewed you out a lot? Or? <laughs> no, uh, because, matter of fact, that's the only one I remember. That was our, he was our chief fire control officer. And when you're a seaman, if you're striking for duty or for a rate, you have to go through your chief. And your chief is the one who decides whether you got the character and the smarts and all that stuff to, to uh, pursue that at that time, pursue that rating. It helped me out a lot. He called me aside and asked me questions about what the test was going to be about. In other words, gave me a lot of personal attention to help me make third class radio. So, and also, he also told us what to do. And, Chief was the chief. If you did what he told you, you was okay, and if you didn't, he could make it a little miserable for you. And did you lose any crew members uh, when you while you were aboard? We lost. I'm not sure of this. I believe we lost one. Uh, it was, he was doing some Mickey Mouse bombardment on a little island out there somewhere, and, and we thought there were no Japs on it. But we was casually firing over there, and uh, we found out that one of them still had a five-inch gun left. They fired it back at us, and as I recall, it failed to explode when it made contact, but it went through the went through the deck and down into the latrine, and then it exploded. My understanding, we lost one person from that. 
but that was the only casualty. What do you remember about uh, after the typhoon, the uh, fleet uh, retired to Ulithi, and uh, Halsey had to appear before a court of inquiry to explain the ship losses. Do you remember any of that? No, I don't. I don't. I don't recall that. Uh, we, shortly after that typhoon, well, I don't believe we were, after that typhoon and, and uh, just for a short period of time during the lady thing, I think we took off back to the States. I believe we were around too much longer after that. We, we, we came back to uh, the state of Bremerton. The Bremerton for some repair work. So, and I don't remember, I do remember the fact that he had to go before board. I don't remember the details of that. Okay, so then you went back to Bremerton. How long were you in Bremerton, do you remember? Well, when we pulled into Bremerton, See, that's probably not exactly right time-wise, but when we pulled into Bremerton uh, on or about uh, April 45, and uh, then I had gotten assigned to Fleet Fire Control School at San Diego, and uh, so we all went on leave. That's the first thing we did. We all went on leave. And I never did come back to the ship after that. I went from the leave to school in San Diego. And then after the school, uh, what happened? The war ended by then? The war had ended. After the school, I had to wait for my, to get enough points to get out. And, uh, and that finally occurred in or about May of 46. How many points was required? Do you remember? Does 44 sound right? 44 points to get out? I really don't remember. Okay. Well, I didn't have enough uh, at the end of the, uh, in the end of the year. I didn't have enough when I graduated out of school, and I had to wait around a while to get. It. And what 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 did you get points for? Do you remember what what? How did you get the points to get out? Uh, so much duty well, on board a ship, and then some. Yeah, I mean, some and, uh, and I think your areas of operation, mission, and so on that gave you points too. Uh, I really don't remember the full detail of that. What did you do for recreation on board the battleship New Jersey? <laughs> well, let's see. There wasn't a whole lot to do. Uh, I remember the air camp the captain checking on me. So we'll start, I'm turning the camera back on now, and uh, we'll start wrapping this up. But you were about to tell us about, how about how about gambling? Was there any gambling on board oh, the yes. ship? Oh, yes. It, we, even though we know it was, you weren't supposed to. Were you a card player? Oh, no. What did you play? What was your... Dice. Dice. Crap games. Crap games. How'd you do? Not too well. <laughs> yeah, it was a... It was a... A recreation cycle. Uh, Oriented around payday? Well, not only that, <laughs> but during between paydays, uh, the way it went was that uh, the winner that had the hot ham going this week would win all the money and he would hire somebody else to pull his shift duty on whatever duty station it was. He'd pay them to do it and as soon as you got enough money standing next to duty, then you'd get back in the game. And maybe you'd have the hot hand, and you'd hire somebody to go and pull your duty. It was a it was a cycle, and then every once in a while the chaplain would come along and solve the whole solution. He'd rake up all the money. 
and we start all over again. <laughs> so, did, yeah. you, did you learn how to shoot craps in the Navy, or did you know before you got? Oh, I knew before. Oh yeah, I knew. I knew before. But uh, my main, if we're going down memory lane here, and we are. The one thing I will never forget is that I had X amount of dollars. I don't remember what it was. That, but on payday, down in the laundry room, they had the number one crap game going in the laundry room. That's where all the sailors converged. The big money. Big money. Now this is one crap game. Well, that means somebody in the immediate vicinity of the crap game doing the, doing the rolling. They're in there, and you're out here somewhere you can't even see the game. But somebody is in the middle of saying, shoot a hundred. Somebody out here, such as yourself, would say, I'll call it. The next thing you know, you're broke and you haven't even seen the game. <laughs> and that, that'll always remember because I went into that game one night and I don't know how much I had with a lot of money at that time for me, because I only drew $28. A month and uh, I lost it all never even saw the game lost every dime I had and I'll always remember that that one game did, it t did you teach you a lesson <laughs> oh it took a while to do that <laughs> took a while <laughs> that was fun we didn't have anything to spend our money on anyhow right. just buy your you make sure you had your cigarettes and your candy bars and that was about it. The rest of it was. How about drinking on board? Was there any booze on board? No booze, but there was a guy named Blackie Hagerman. I've been looking for him ever since I got out. Blackie was from Gary, Indiana. And Blackie operated the, the uh, optic shop. His job was to clean all the various optics around the ship. So he had some alcohol, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> and they called it Pink Lady. And uh, everybody knew that you could go to Blackie's coffee shop and drink, drink a Pink Lady, which was coffee with a shot of Pink Lady. Where we made open? One dollar. For your convenience? Blackie, uh, uh, as you may recall, we didn't get paid. We just our money that we were owed got posted up on a roster, and we wanted to get in. We could write a voucher and get some money. That's the way the Navy pay system was then. Or as I know, for the two years I was on board ship, Blackie never drew one dime out of his account. He didn't have to. He was bootlegging up in the optic shop. <laughs> So he stockpiled his pay. Huh? Yeah, he didn't have to. He didn't have to. And Blackie didn't gamble. And so he he had he, so he had, kept it all. He kept it all. So he had it. <laughs> How about liberties? Do you remember any uh, uh, particular liberties that you had that were memorable that you want to talk about? <laughs> I don't remember any of being memorable. I only had one. Only one. Down in Honolulu, a short period of time. I don't remember being too memorable. No, I don't remember being. Memorable. Okay. I, 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 myself, I went when I went went ashore. Uh, I came back a little bit unbalanced, but I remember that. I remember that during that same liberty, though, when I was helping uh, off of the deck, bring bring the guys back aboard ship after we were coming back from liberty. Some of them were walking up the gangplank and falling off in the water in the interim, and we had to go down and place them up. And the next morning, they had to go see the executive officer, who was referred to as captain sometimes. And that was probably right in this here, room. Right here. <laughs> this, so is where, this is where the XO held captain's mast, yeah, which uh, was a disciplinary proceeding yeah, well, for I, wayward sailors. I stayed out of this room. <laughs> Any available 
In closing, uh, well, before we close, what did you do? Did you have any connection with the Navy after you got out? No, sir. Now, what did you do after you got out of the uh, service? Well, I I messed around, got together with guys, we did our normal things, uh, drank a little bit and what have you, and then after I was out a couple of years, some Army recruiting sergeant got along and talked me into join the Army. Really? Right. So you didn't have enough of the Navy, of the military in the Navy, you well, joined the Army. When was that? What year was that? 1948. 48. And how long did you serve in the Army? 21 years. 21 years? Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's where, that's a, you're a more experienced Army man than you are I'm a Navy a, man. And I, I became a Chief Warrant Officer four. Guided missile aircraft. Wow, that's impressive. That's an impressive career. Retired, retired 1969. So you saw? Did you see any action uh, in uh, Korea? No, I'm very fortunate. Uh, where did you serve primarily while you were in the army? Stateside. Stateside. Whereabouts in the country? Well, we had missiles, anti-aircraft missile sites. That was during the Cold War. And we had sites in all the major cities across the country, i.e. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Chicago, New York. Did you spend time at any particular ones or did you just move around? Spent about four years at three or four of them. I was in Pittsburgh Defense, Chicago Defense, Dallas Fort Worth Defense, and that was it. Okay. And about four years at each one of them. And then I was in Korea for a year or so, which was not very long, of course. Okay, how did the service in the military, both Navy and Army, impact your life, Joe? What did it do for you? Anything? Well, it made me realize that we all need some guidance, that we all need a work ethic, and uh, and we need some uh, character guidance too. And it's all good. It's all good. Uh, it, it bases makes you uh, able to take orders, and it makes you able to give orders. It's just all good, all good. If you want it to be, if you want to fight it, you know, it won't work for you. And it won't last. But once you recognize that. Somebody's in charge of you, and you're expected, you're expected to do certain things. So. I always admired the Navy, even after I went into the Army, believe it or not. Whenever I'd be asked to recommend somebody to go into service, I'd say, young man, go in the Navy. Why? Because at that time, the Navy treated you more like a man out in civilian life. In other words, in the Army, to differentiate in the Army, we have some, at the time again, we had such basic things that we were forced to do, like we had to get up and go to breakfast. We had to get up and do this. And that had to do that. The Navy, they gave you an option. They said, breakfast is served at such and such a time. If you don't want to go eat breakfast, that's your business. Chief would show you where you're quartered, where you're supposed to go to work at at 8 o'clock. Never be there. He can tell you how to get there, he just said be there. And uh, uh, some, uh, one of your other officers would tell you how to take care of your living quarters. He didn't fuss at you, he just told you how to do it. And if you didn't do it, you'd expect to get your rear end chewed out. But it treated you more like a man. You know, gave you, gave you, told you what your responsibilities were. And they entrusted you to do it, and only damn fool would not do it, you know. So yeah, it, it, it teaches you, it teaches you that there are responsibilities, and and, and you can do it. You can do it. Okay. Are there any other stories you would like to tell us about about your from your army or navy experience that I haven't asked you about already? 
Uh, it probably is, but I can't remember one right now. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there's uh, one or two. But not the one that falls off the wall is that I've been in the Army too. But that's not unusual. A lot of Marines joined the Army too after World War II. For various reasons. We just Most of us, we just, I think most of us, by going back in, we knew what it was all about and we, we, uh, we appreciated a little bit of guidance. Mm -hmm. But we just all needed, you know. Like I tell my children, I said, the reason, the only way you, the, the, the uh, I had a lot of occasions at the end of my career where I went in front of uh, the, the Navy's equipment, or the Army's equipment of the captain. Well, he used to call me in at, at my rating. I was just assigned a little major. He used to call me in for guidance on certain issues. Because I was one of, I was basically a staff member. Well, you're allowed to put your input in because you, you're knowledgeable, but you also are told sometimes to shut up because the captain's heard enough, so to speak. Well, that's when you shut up. You don't keep, you don't keep running. And you don't learn that unless you had an opportunity to be out of the gun. Nobody tells you to shut up. That's what you mean, shut up. All right. Well. That uh, I think we're going to wrap up now, Joe. I appreciate you taking the time out of your tour here. I noticed that even though you were, spent 21 years in the Army, you come to the your Navy reunion. Do you also participate in some Army reunions? Yes. Okay. We don't. We uh, we don't have as many. They're not as meaningful because our small units are. Our small units are not here. They're all being ground up into concrete. It's a, it's a there's nothing that uh, there's nothing that hurts an ex-military man than to go back to his basic roots and, and see see what it is compared to what it was. See that there's nothing left. In other words, if you're in a if you're in the uh, Navy stationed at a military base at a base. You always remember that everything was painted, everything was primed and proper, all the grass was mowed properly and what have you. And that's the way it was. That would be the same way with the ship. Then after you're out and the unit's no longer there, it's, it almost breaks your heart to see how it just falls apart. You know? And like this ship here, uh, I, I think about it sitting out here. You're concerned about it deteriorating? Is that no? I'm thinking about it. if I was a person, how lonely I would be sitting out here by myself all the time. No, no life is sitting here. I think about that. But it had life. It had life. It had people moving around doing a job. Now all at once somebody's tied it up. And said you can't go no more. Not only did they tie it up, they take it, take its soul out of it. It's just sitting here. I realize that people like yourself are, are taking care of it. I We try to take care of it. When I go by, when I go by, you know, I'm out in the country and I see any ship. For example, before this one, it was the USS Alabama. When I see it sitting over there all by itself, people driving by, out of market. They don't think how lonely that is to see it sitting there like that. Because it once, a, once was a vibrant thing, you know. Horns were blowing, whistles and flags were waving, people were coming and going. It was a little city. But here it is sitting here. Now, you cannot but think about it. And I do. 
Well, we hope you enjoy coming back to the battleship. Yeah, I do. Good. I do. Joe, I want to thank you again for uh, for allowing us, giving us some of your time for this interview. And we want to thank you for your service both in the U.S. Navy and the Army. And I'm going to close by labeling the end of the tape. Again, this is the interview is with uh, Joseph Husik. It's Hosik. Hosik. I'm sorry. And my name is Ron Guitardi, and I'm uh, the assistant director of the oral history program on board the battleship New Jersey. And the date is August the 10th, 2012. Thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome.